Okay, we're learning Masechet Shabbat, Daf Yud Dalad Amud Aleph, Ocha Ocha Rishon, Ocha Ocha Sheni, My Time, Gazrube Rabbanu Tuma. So Rashi says, uh, if a person eats something with the first degree of impurity status, that uh, it makes his very body a, 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 a Rishon Tuma, a first degree of impurity status, and uh, similar with the secondary degree. So um, he's gonna, if he touches Truma, he's going to make it impure. Like like a shlishi, he's a she's a sheni. He's gonna make it a shlishi. He's a rishon. He's gonna make it a sheni. Um, and so, um, the zimni, the real. What's the reason the gemara asks? The gemara answers the zimni the achel ochlin tmein umashkin mashkin the truma the shade lefuma. Sometimes a person is gonna eat uh, impure foods and he's going to drink impure liquid, uh, impure let's say. Uh, liquids that have become impure, he's going to throw them in his mouth with Fasilahu and he's make them all tame. So, in Yashotim Mashkin Tmei, in my time, a Gazer Beder Ban and Tuma, somebody drinks impure liquids, but what's the reason that the rabbi said that it's gonna, that's going to make him tame? If you drink, if you drink something tame and you touch um, uh, to Truma, let's say, he's going to make that, that, that tithe produce impure and he's not going to be able to give it to the, the priest? What's, what's the reason? It's a, it's a gazera. It's actually not not a little letter of the law. It's a special protective measure. Why? Because zimnin the shat mashkin tmein. Because sometimes a person eat drinks impure liquids. But shakil ochlin the truma v'shadei levume u'faselu. And when he's he's drinking impure liquids and he's got a cracker or something and he eats it, and he's gonna he's gonna be uh, some truma of food or something. Or he's gonna food that he might think about um, consecrating. Or perhaps it's whatever. It's, it's uh, if he's drinking, he might put some food in his mouth, and the liquid in his mouth that is already impure is going to make the food impure. In which case, the food is going to make him impure. Let's say I think we're just talking about according to Rashi, is just a piece of chicken. Um, there's a, a piece of chicken that's in, um, it's pure, and he's going. What he's going? What's he going to do? He's going to uh, make his chicken impure, um, and therefore he will be he will become impure from the from the the, the, the the liquid in his mouth is going to make the chicken impure and therefore making him impure and even though the liquid wouldn't necessarily make him impure that requires further study don't take my word for it but anyhow the touch the contact of the liquid in the mouth with the food with the chicken in his mouth is going to give him the status of being impure in the secondary degree which could puzzle truma in the third degree now if he eats it's uh, if he eats something with the third third degree of truma and even though then he can impart, he is, it's like he has a third degree of, tru, of impurity, tuma, and he's going to be um, conferring that status of impurity on something he touches, such as concentrate, consecrated items. Truma. So, uh, my time ago, I said that. So, like I said, I know that, but it's the same thing. So what does it matter if he's eat, eating and, he, and, then he, and then he has a little drink? Or if, he, or if he's drinking and then he has something to eat, the foods are going to come into contact with his mouth anyway. It's the same thing. You might have thought that this is, uh, if somebody's drinking, uh, somebody's eating, um, it's not a problem when you're eating, when you're drinking, because when somebody drinks, they're not necessarily going to eat. They're just drinking for the thirst. So he's drinking, so what? He's not gonna. You know, he drank something that's tummy. He's not gonna make anything else tummy. And, and so what if he touches something? But no, because he might eat something. Is that, so you might think, oh, but that's not that's not the case. The, the, the sages say no, it could happen. It's it's faulty th- faulty thinking. And I how shlichi means when you eat, you usually drink a little bit. Okay, next next sugya. So they so but basically what the sages did is they. Um, they decreed that both cases are eating or drinking of, a, of a, something that's impure of a secondary or, or tertiary degree of impurity will in fact make somebody impure enough to puzzle truma that he touches to so disqualified tithe produce from the temple for the temple there was a decree against the person putting a becoming um uh, Shower, basically dumping drawn water over himself and thinking he might become pure from it. My time ago, Tuma. What's the reason that the Rabbanan made a decree that uh, that he's impure from dumping three log of water over him? Again, uh, in the last uh, video, I was unsure about how much a log is. Um, something like a gallon, I don't know. 
Um, you have to check that out. But a log of water, it's uh, say 1.6 gallons. Check it out yourself. So three log of water coming poured over somebody would actually turn, make the person impure. Why would that be? You have to understand the history of what's going on here. They used to they used to immerse in really dirty water. Okay, they didn't always have water sources available, and in order to re- remove many state security, one has to immerse in living water, a spring, a river, and so forth. So. And sometimes they didn't have any, any other place to become pure, so they'd have to go in a place that, eh, these days you wouldn't really want to go in, it's like the Archon River or the Hudson River or something like that. Um, and afterwards, I got to take a shower. So they, afterwards they take um, three, four, whatever gallons, of five gallons of water, and they pour it over themselves to clean off. This became a, rich, uh, a regular practice. You go into the, the, the spring or the river, I need to take a shower, and then you pour the, pour the water, the three, the three log, it's a, the, the wet measure of water, which is a considerable amount of water, you know, buckets of water over their head, or a shower in these days, right? Um, so that became a regular thing. Go to go to the spring, then take a shower. Go to the spring, take a shower. So the rabbis made a decree. Gazrul em tuma. The, the rabbis, even though they weren't, the, this water is not tame. The person is technically pure. And then the rabbis come along and say, "Oh, you take a shower, it makes you impure." How, where do they get off on that? How do they have the power to do that? Who are these rabbis anyway? No, the rabbis have the power of of, of heter and they have the power of iser. They realized that for the generation that there was a reason for it. Let me explain. My kavad, Gemara explains the reasoning. Amar Abaye shehayu omrim lo elu tarim elu veelu matarim because they started thinking that if this, the uh, the widespread belief among the people of Israel at the time was it's the the you, uh, immersing in the spring water or the river makes you pure and also the the, the pouring the the bucket three log of buckets of buckets of the three log amounts of water also makes you pure. Amar le Rava. Rava said, "My my Navkamina, what's the difference between the two? Hakatavle bahana. It doesn't make a difference because he's already become pure. And the uh, how, how can they make how can they make such a gezera, a decree? Amar el Amar Rava, because the person's pure. And they say they can say the the uh, uh, drawn water that is not it's not impure in any any way. It's pure drawn water. It's not impure drawn water. The clean water is pouring over them is gonna gonna make them in a state of impurity." So that's that's um, that's that's Rava's question to Abaya. Um, so again, Amar Abaya. Abaya said they would say that the, both of them, both the, both the spring and the and the buckets of water are going to make you pure. Amar le Rava. Rava said to him, "What's the difference?" He, he, he immersed himself. He's pure. Ella Amar Rava, but Rava said, "No, the, I'll explain to you what it is." Abaya, Rava says, "Shahayu Omrim Lo Elumatarim Ella Ella Elumatari," because they'd come. A lot of simple people started thinking, "No, it's actually not the dirty, stinky water that you just just toiled in." Okay, it's you know some water. It's water, but it doesn't look so so clean. It's still water. It's not going to hurt the person to go into, but you know the people people don't like things that are disgusting, right? So, but still, it's a law, and they, they don't have any other they don't have a clean source, so they go into a source that it's, though it's not hygienically dangerous, so it's not going to cause them any kind of health problems. So they still they still go in, and afterwards they get this grody feeling, right? So you want to shower. So they so people started thinking, no, it's not that water's dirty. That's not going to make me pure. It's actually the shower afterward that's making me pure. And people started really believing this. So for that reason, the, the sages decreed that these this three log amounts of water poured over the person after he went into a less than perfect spring water or river is actually uh, it, it has the status of impure water. In, impure. Those three log are impure. Next, but Tahor Shinaflu al Roshov Rugo Shloshulugin Maim Shuvim. The Mishnah mentions that the, one of the eighteen decrees, the, we're talking about the eighteen decrees that Beit Shammai won over Beit Hillel. Um, that um, a pur- pure person who had three, uh, that his most, another person who was impure was this. 
the sages decreed impurity for a pure person who had um, who um, had three log of water poured over his head and most of his body. My time, a gazu Rabbanan, Tuma. Why did the rabbis say this three log, um, uh, what, is, what was it, like uh, two, three gallons, four gallons of water poured over him? Why is this water impure? De'iloha lo kaimaha. Ha in Aramaic means this. Because if this wasn't true, that wouldn't be true. Meaning, because there was a necessary to make the decree over completely pure water and a completely pure person per person who doesn't need another immersion, he's already pure after the first time and without the bucket being poured over him, or buckets, because um, if, if it's not so, then the, the originally, the original gezera, the original decree could not be fulfilled, meaning the original decree was that he because they wouldn't make a distinction between a completely pure person who comes out of the mikveh and, and somebody who's not. Um, so the next sugya says, the sefer my taima gazru be rabban and tuma. What is what for what reason did the sages decree that if a person did not done natila sidayim that if he touches a, a a holy holy writing like like a sefer Torah, a Torah scroll, or a scroll of Esther, so forth? What's uh, that, that, that he would make it impure? We have a principle that Dibre Torah Enam Mekablim Tuma, the words of Torah cannot become impure. So, how could they make, why did they need to make such a decree? What were they trying to protect? Amar Rav Masharshia Shabbatrila Hayu Matsni Inet Ochlin the Truma Etzel Sefer Torah. Rav Masharshia explains, he said that initially they used to take Truma, tied produce, and they used to store it in together with the same place they stored the Torah scrolls in the, in the Holy Ark or wherever they kept it, um, in a safe place. Um, so people said, this is holy and this is holy. The Sefer Torah is holy and the Shuma is holy. When they saw that the mice started to eat the Sefer Torah because the mice could get in there, they, they, weren't, they didn't have a, a safe enough place to keep the mice out, and the mice would get in and they wouldn't only eat the Shuma, they wouldn't eat only the tithe produce, but they'd also nibble away on the Torah scroll. Because mice, they just they like to nibble. They like to, and paper, they love to eat paper. They actually, if you check out a mouse hole someday, which you may or may not, um, probably not, you, but if you're interested in such a thing, you could see that the mice holes are lined often with chewed up pieces of paper. So they saw that the mice started nibbling away at the Torah scrolls, the Gazur Beit Rabban and Tuma. So, the, so the, in order to protect the Torah scrolls, the the sages said that the Torah, if somebody had not done it to the diamond, touched the Torah scroll, some which quite possibly could happen, that it would become Tameh. So the, all, the Torah scrolls were always, you didn't know if it was Tameh or not, based on this decree. You didn't know if it was impure. And if the Torah scroll is impure, it's not going to be a place where you're going to put your, your pure, holy, uh, tithed produce that's, that's intended for the priests in the Holy Temple. But Yadayim, why did the sages decree that just basic, your basic average hands are impure? Obviously, hands, you don't know where they've been. They could go here, they could go there, you could be talking to somebody, you could be touching God knows what. So you got to say, Yadayim, hands have a, uh, are, are basically any hands uh, of un uncertain status, you just assume that they are tame, impure. So the Gemara says, Like I said, you touch this, you touch that. People touch things without thinking. Tana, af yadayim haba'ot machmat sefer poslot et truma. It's taught that even that um, if it hands to touch a, 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 a Torah scroll will go on to posl to disqualify tithe produce. Mishum de Rabbi Parna. This is how could this be? This is based on the on the decree of the teaching of Rabbi Parna, a sage. Uh, and he said, Amar Rabbi, Rabbi Parna, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, he said, the neighbor Rabbi Yochanan, O Ches Sefer Torah Arom, Nikbar Arom. Rabbi Parna said, He who touches the, 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 the Torah scroll naked shall be buried naked. Now, what did he mean? He said, After they, dis after they said that hands are basic, uh, that un hands, unless you, you, you absolutely know that somebody has, what, has done Netzilat to die and we're going to the mikveh, and afterwards you, do the you wash your hands after you go to the mikveh too. So if you're not certain that somebody's hands are clean, then you assume that they are unclean. This was true for all Jews in this time of the decree. 
Um, so why, why, uh, what did he mean by he who touches the Torah scroll naked shall be buried naked? Let's say he meant it literally. The, the, the custom was, and even the Ramah brings down, that when we, in the, the, the great posik of the Ashkenazi Jews, the uh, Moshe Israelis tells us that um, when we go to move the Torah scroll and adjust it to change the pages, sometimes you have to adjust the parchment a little bit. You, do it, you, you don't do it with your bare fingers, but you do it with a, a talit or with a cloth or something like that, so you're not directly touching the parchment. So, um, so that, became, that was a very ancient custom. So they were doing this back in the Talmudic times, at least in, around Rav Parnach, or in his shul and under his jurisdiction, um, and his students. So he said, because he made a decree for his whole town, perhaps, that somebody who touches the Torah scroll naked, meaning touches it with his bare hand, shall be buried naked. And a lot of people thought that this meant that they would actually uh, be thrown in their graves naked without the proper burial shrouds, the proper respect due to the corpse. These days, everybody's so freaked out, they probably couldn't care less whether they're buried naked, you know. But um, I think a lot of people... Uh, don't, they want to be buried in a proper, honorable way. Um, but anyhow, so what did he really mean? Some say that the Amar Parach Amar Rabbi Yochanan, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, in the, from, from the city of Tiberias, the first Amora, or the la, one of the last Tanayim, first Amora in Israel. Ha'ocha Sefer Torah Arom Nikbar Arom. Arom Salchadatak, does it mean literally naked? No. Ela Amar Rabbi Zera Arom Belo Mitzvot. He who touches the Torah scroll with his bare hands, it's as if he's naked of mitzvot. It's as if he does not have commandments and, 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 and good deeds to his credit. Below mitzvot salchadatach, would you say that this person doesn't, what if this person kept every law in the Torah except for the fact that he touched the Torah scroll with his bare hands and he hadn't properly washed his hands? What? We're going to be so, you know, just because he messed up one time, he messes up one time, he doesn't go to heaven? No, that's not what it means. Ela ema arom below ota mitzvah. He's naked of this one mitzvah. He's not careful of this one mitzvah. And as we know from the Pirkei Avot, that just one we assume that the world is 50% guilty and 50% innocent. Just assume that every all the Jews are together. The whole world is together. All the Jews are together. All the Jews are together, and we assume that half of half of the, the Jews are, are guilty and half of the Jews are innocent. Because we don't know. Maybe kaf sechut. We're supposed to say that 51% of Israel is innocent meaning has more mitzvot and good deeds and, and Torah to their credit than not. Um, so, but, we, but Rambam says, you assume that in the, in the Pirkei Avos says, assume it's a 50-50, guilty, innocent. So, uh, what I'm darshaning from this, this is my own drasha from this for Rabbi Parnach and Daf, uh, in this Misafi Shabbos, is that... Just that one mitzvah, even if one does all of the mitzvah and he neglects one mitzvah, he should assume that that one mitzvah that he neglected, maybe that's the reason the Mashiach didn't come and the, and the world didn't, and peace and goodness didn't, and light did not spread throughout the world. Because he, he missed one mitzvah for people who are very concerned with mitzvah. And for people who aren't so concerned with mitzvah, it might just take one little mitzvah, even if a person does everything wrong or doesn't care about anything, but he does one good thing, gives one tzedakah, he says one kind word to a person, he just does uh, is one, uh, he's a good ambassador for Israel or whatever, he's a good ambassador for the religious people. So uh, any, any one mitzvah could also change the whole world from the scale of guilt to the scale of merit. Let's get on. Arom below mitzvah, he's naked from that one mitzvah. Below mitzvah, tzakadatach, ala'ima arom below ota mitzvah, like he just said. Hey, Gazor Beresha, the Gemara asks, which gazera among all of these gazera, uh, these decrees, was initially decreed? If you say the one that was first decreed, Kevanda Hakazor Boresha, if you say that the impurity of the hands, saying that your average hands are impure, was the first one that was decreed of the 18. You know, it's mentioned last. Kevanda Hakazor Boresha, Hatu Lamalid, then what do I need all of these other ones for? 
if they do, if they made a special decree to say that hands are impure, then why do I need to go ahead and make all of these other decrees of impurity about the hands, whereas touching the Sefer Torah, etc.? Because in any event, they're, un- they're impure. In other words, just say, you don't need to go through this whole thing about the Sefer Torah and touching the Sefer Torah. Just say, basically, hands are impure, so we know that... Uh, we, we know we know that if somebody had not verifiably washed their hands, he can't touch a separate Torah. So we just you don't even have to go through this whole rigmarole. Just say that hands are, basic hands are impure. Why talk about the Torah scroll? What's the answer? But certainly it is so. Concerning hands that have touched the Torah scroll, that was the first decree. And then they may, went on and made a dis- decree about all hands in all situations that any hands that not had verifiably had been washed or a um, person that's not careful about ritual hand washing, then, then we suspect that the hands could make truma impure. Tithe produce would no longer be valid. Next, sugya tevul yom, tevul in the list of the 18 decrees. Um, we say that somebody who had, uh, let's say, a Zav, for, for instance, somebody who touched the Sheretz, or a, a, all I really know is that the law of the Zav and the Zava, um, a Zav is a man who had a gonorrheal emission, a woman who has had a, a woman who has any emission after their, seven, their woman's cycle of seven and eleven days, um, the seven, during the first sighting of blood, there's a seven day period where she's a Nida, and then there's an eleven day period where she's considered a Zava. And um, so it's considered a, the normal time is the seven days, and after that it's considered a that's considered just nida blood, menstrual blood, and afterward the eleven days is considered ziva, the blood of a, a zav. And because we did today, we can't distinguish between uh, zava blood and nida blood. We we um, um, for any sighting of blood, a woman waits seven days. Cliche counts seven clean days, and then she goes to the mikvah after nightfall, um, rendering her pure. In the old days, nida was a law of purity, meaning that if a woman who had been menstruating had not yet purified herself in the mikveh, touched a vessel like a spoon or a cup or something in the house or anything that's, a, that's, a, that, uh, that's considered a, halakhically a vessel, I mean, it has a bit kibul, it can receive something, it's a complete thing, etc., um, then it would render it, have the impurity of, of menstrual blood of nida on the vessels. But nowadays, it's, they no longer have the laws of impurity, so nowadays, the laws of nida um, are, are more a law of Isra Vahetra, whether she's permitted to her husband or not permitted to her husband. So uh, the, uh, for a Zav, it's different. It's any, any man um, who had a gonorrheal emission associated with pain. In other words, a fluid came out of any flu- a fluid that came out of his orifice that is not based on arousal from a woman is called a Zava. It's often associated, not often, but perhaps not always associated with pain. It's any, any emission that has nothing to do with a, a, a arousal or uh, from a woman. Or from, uh, so, uh, the, um, so that's, he re- rendered that, that emission of the man re- renders him what we call a zav. Um, so what, what should he do? As I said in the previous YouTube, he should go to a doctor and get some pills. Um, uh, the, and that's also halacha. The other halacha is he has to wait seven days, and then afterwards, on the seventh day, he goes to a, a mayan, a spring, or uh, perhaps an ocean. But he can't go to a mikveh, a, an in, indoor uh, ritual bath. Um, he has to go to living water, and then he and he immerses himself after seven. I mean, he usually does it just before the end of the seventh day, and then after the emergence of the stars on the uh, roughly a half hour after sunset, um, after the completion of seven full days, um, the, it takes effect that he is no longer a Zav. So what does the, um, what does the Gemara say? So, Tavul Yom. So, so somebody who had the, the Zav, let's say, who had immersed, or in a, a number, there are a number of other kinds of impurity that, um, for instance, if that day he saw a, a seminal emission based on arousal from a woman, or if he had cohabited with his wife, or for any reason he had a, a, a emission 
um, a normal uh, seminal emission, then um, he uh, he's rendered impure that day. That day he is rendered impure until he, he goes to a mikveh. He could go to a mikveh or uh, not necessarily a spring water, but he could go to an into, indoor heated mikveh also, kosher mikveh. And that would render him, but in the old days he was impure and he could he could impart a certain level of impurity by touching things um, un, until he'd gone to the mikveh. So at the, before he immerses, after he immerses himself during the day, let's say, until the emergence of the stars, he's called a tavul yom. Okay? So they, they, the sages decreed the law of the tvul yom, the one who had immersed but had not yet waited till it got dark. Said the Kochavim. So the, the Gemara says, Tvul yom deraitihi. The law of tvul yom is a law in a, a scripturally ordained. He's, it's a scripturally ordained level of impurity. As is written, Nefesh Shotiga, Bo, anybody who touches it, but Tamea the Arab, and he's impure until the night. He's not allowed to eat consecrated foods until he, he washes himself in water, which always means to go to the mikveh and immerse himself completely. Even in the days of the Exodus, they used to immerse themselves completely. So, um, so it's a deraita. It says, and then. Uh, but and then the sun goes down and he's pure, meaning after the stars come up. The achar yochal min akodshim, and after that the verse says in the book, book of Leviticus chapter 22, he can then after the stars come out and it's night time, he can eat from uh, kodshim, he can eat uh, the holy foods. Let's say it was a kohen in the temple, it was very serious law for kohenim because they couldn't eat their the, the priests couldn't eat their lunch or dinner, and they're not supposed to starve in the temple um, because that's his bread, right? So, un- so until until the the Tzedek Kochavim, half hour after sunset, he is forbidden from touching consecrated things, meaning truma. Kochim is it could all, it says here specific, specifically truma, tithe, produce. But I think it would also hold for uh, animals. Uh, and the answer is, so what's the question again? Tzvul Yom is a, is a scripturally done law. Why are they making a rabbinic ordinance on a scripturally done law? That's the question. The answer is, Same Mikan. Erase from the list of the, the uh, of these decrees. Erased from these list of these decrees. I'm just going to close the door. Please keep this door closed. So, so it says same. Uh, the the Gemara says same mikan tuvuliyom. Just erase tuvuliyom from this. We already have a the Torah law. Why do we need rabbinic law? So the. This, this perhaps should not be on a list of the 18 Gezeras, the 18 decrees. It should be raised from the list of the decrees decreeing impurity on drinks, specifically. And so the Gemara says, Well, The, the Mishnah said that foods that had become impure from drinks. Bamashkin Damai. So, uh, f- drinks that had become impure from what? What are we talking about? If you say that the impure, their impurity comes from contact with a sheritz, Ilema Bamashkin Habain Machmat Sheritz, meaning, um, there's a, a, a dead mouse. I touch the dead mouse, and then um, even, and then I go over and I take a, a, a glass of wine, and I drink the glass of wine, or I touch the wine, or something like that. Touch the dead mouse, touch the wine, or any sherets, any dead creeping animal. 
it's still a little wet. Um, so, uh, in such a case, let's say it's talking about disqualifying, uh, making things impure from the impurity of a shevitz, uh, dead creeping thing. So, in such a case, that's the right in the right in him. These kinds of the, the, also these kinds of impurities are also scripturally ordained. So we, when we're talking about the, the impurity of uh, sheretz, any drink that a per, and it says in Vayikra 11 and Leviticus 11, kol mashke sher yishte v'kol kli yitma. Kol mashke asher yishate. Any drink that he drinks. Any drink that he drinks from any vessel shall become impure. We already have a Torah law. Why do we need a rabbinic law about it? There's already a Torah law about it. But rather, what we're talking about here is is, is the following. We're talking about drinks. And remember, when we're talking about mashkin here, we're talking about seven specific kinds of uh, wine, honey, milk, etc., and, f- and four others. So when we're talking about drinks that have become impurity from the hands, what are we talking about? There's, uh, the, 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 the drinks that have become impure from the hands, there's certain other, there's certain other things that become impure at a level in the rabbinic law. So, we're talking about drinks that became impure from the, from touching hands, touching tummy hands, which are rabbinic in, or in, their, in their in their authority, rabbinic law, and the gazubahem tuma, and we, they made a decree of impurity upon them uh, based on the law of the problem of somebody who touched a, a dead creepy thing and then touched the liquid, which is a scriptural law. So in other words, this is a rabbinic law that derives from a scriptural law. So yes, yes, it's not, it's not like replacing, not saying, oh, we already have a scriptural law. No, the scriptural law, according to the sages, it wasn't enough. It wasn't. Un- we didn't. People didn't understand the proper ramifications of it. So they, they they made a special decree to show what the what the what the extent of the law was, as it wasn't simply one thing. It was also another uh, a number of others. Then and among and among the decrees that they decreed on that day, they also decreed about vessels that had become um, impure. If a vessel had become pure, the Gemara asks the following question about that. What kind of liquids make these vessels impure? What kind of liquids are making them impure? If you say that this question is about the the, the, the liquids are not drinks, like we're not talking about drinks like wine, milk, water, whatever. We're talking about uh, bodily fluids here. Now we're, we're talking about bodily fluids. So what kind of fluids are we talking about? Since so we're talking about the, the emissions of a zav. That is to say, what, like a zav or any, any, under, uh, any other emission that could come out from a zav. The meaning is, is, is uh, saliva or is urine or any other, any other bodily fluid that could come out. These are all impure from... With, from uh, from the Torah, the right as it is written, "Viki Yarokazav," because we have we, fight, we have a pasuk, "Viki Yarokazav Batahor." And the a person, uh, if if uh, Zav, if uh, if a person who has a, a Zav spits on something that's pure, or a person that's pure, the Chavez Begadav, the person or the uh, object, um, I guess, let's say so, somebody he doesn't spit on him. Somehow he doesn't go like, like I hate you. <laughs> no, it could be that, or it could be just somehow his saliva came in contact with a pure person, but unintentionally happens. Your grandpa drooled on you. Who knows? You know, whatever. Okay, um, 
so, uh, so what, what should he do? The Torah says in, in, in the 15th chapter of Leviticus, it says, the person shall wash his clothing, and he shall wash himself in water, and he will be impure until the night. So your poor, your, your poor grandpa who's a, who's a Zav, he, he, he was like nodding off, and you like had your head in his lap or something, and a little drop of spittle uh, fell, fell on you. It's like you wake up and like, oy vey, grandpa drilled on me. I'm a, I, he's a Zav. Uh, what do I do? So what if it dropped on your so your you and your clothing become impure. You gotta what you gotta put your clothing in the mikvah and you gotta put yourself in the mikvah. And your tummy out of erev, meaning that he has to go to the mikvah just before sunset and then after sunset, um, he has to wait till the three medium stars come out a half hour after sunset. And we learn from this Mashabiya the Tahor Timeti Lacha. What does that mean? It means... What is in the hands of the pure, I have made impure for you. As that is to say, it's not only the person who touched, the, touched him, uh, the only, not only the person who touched the... not only the person who touched the fluids of the Zav becomes impure, but even the objects which are in his hands. I was thinking clothing here, because it says in the verse Begadav, but the Gemara here says it, it's something, the law is actually anything he's holding in his hand would also become impure and would require immersion in a kosher mikvah. But rather here we're talking about liquids that have become impure, machmat sheretz, that have become impure from contact with, with a creeping, uh, impure creeping thing. According to the law of the Torah, the scriptural law, um, the asheritz does not make a vessel impure. So uh, the mouse climbs into the earthenware jar and dies there. It's not going to make the earthenware jar impure. But the sages made a decree uh, uh, saying that the sheritz could make vessels impure based on a comparison to the uh, bodily fluids coming out of a zav. Next sugya. Yadayim tami de shamay vehil gazur. Yadayim tami de shamay vehil gazur. Gemara asks the following question. Yadayim tami de shamay vehil gazur. The hands of the hands of shamay and hilo makes a decree upon them. It renders them too much. Did, did shamay say that? Did hilo? Uh, the Shammai makes a decree and then Hillel becomes impure. Hillel didn't agree. So did, was the, was the, were these decrees in binding on Beit Hillel? I assume, well, you would assume that if they nimnu v'rabu, if they had outnumbered them and it's a majority rule, acharei rabim latot, that, uh, that the Hillel would, would be bound to follow the law of Beit Shammai. So we were going to discuss this a little bit. Um, the Tanya Yosef ben Yoezer each trade of Yosef ben Yochanan each to the Shlaim Gazru Tuma Aleretz Ha'amim Va'al Kleitz Kuchit Yosef ben Yoezer and Yosef ben Yochanan of Yerushalayim they made a special decree about impurity on the land of lands outside of Israel and about um, glass vessels. Basically, according to the law. Basically, according to the law. Uh, the, the, the land of Israel is the holy land and lands are outside of Israel because we don't know where uh, where the graves are there's a lot of graves mixed into the earth and often we don't know where they are so we don't know if we're walking over a grave in Israel they're very careful about the graves and where the graveyards are even in ancient times and uh, outside of Israel we just don't know there's a lot of slaughter in Alexandria they slaughtered 10,000 70,000 Jews in one day I don't know the, the, it's uh, part of ancient history we have to re, uh, review it uh, we, go, we go to Auschwitz. If you go to Auschwitz uh, today, it's the top tourist attraction in Poland. And you're walking along the path. Uh, the, the tour guide, he, he bent down and he, and he said, Rabbi, you have to see, these are remains of human bones. The rabbi happened to be a coin. He wasn't so happy about it. Um, anyhow, whatever, there's, it's not just that's an extreme example, Auschwitz, but anywhere you never know where there's a grave and, um, and a dead body imparts impurity. So, the, so they, they used to be that they didn't have such a decree because, the, because they noticed that there was a lot of slaughter and a lot of bones here and there, and we just didn't know where the human remains were. In India, 
Turkey, the, the known world at that time, or anywhere, they just said anywhere else in the world we just don't know, so we assume that it's a Tame land, because of the graves in the land. We don't know where the graves are. So, um, and also he, uh, the, these two sages also made a decree about the impurity of glass vessels. Glass vessels being impure is a, is a decree. Shimon ben Shetach tikan ketuba leisha v'gazar tuma al klez matachot. Shimon ben Shetach enacted the decree, which still is part of the practical law today, that a woman who gets married, you write her a ketuba, a valid marriage contract. That started with Shimon ben ben Shetach. He was the first one to make a ketuba. And v'gazar tuma al klez matachot. And Shimon ben Shetach also made a special decree that metal vessels would become impure. Why? Um... Kick Rashi. Kick in Yiddish doesn't mean like it does in English. In Yiddish, kick means to look. Unless you're from Galicia, in which case it means cook. Cook Rashi. So in English, that also sounds kind of funny. What are you going to put them in the oven? Cook Rashi? No. You make a Rashi stew? No. Cook Rashi means look at Rashi. Look at Rashi. Yeah, that, that funny was so, so funny, so old, I almost fell off my dinosaur. Anyhow, um, my, my son tells me I really shouldn't try to be funny because we just don't come from funny stock. Anyhow, um, Rashi says, the, the decree of the impurity of glass vessels, because it's not written in the Torah. Glass vessels are not mentioned in the Torah and it doesn't, when it talks about the laws of purity. And Tiken Ketubah, what about Ketubah? Um, when a... The, the, the uh, uh, responsibility of properties is not what um, you, you write. She has achrayos on the, the husband has achrayos on the properties. In other words, the marriage dissolves. Then, uh, for if it's the husband's fault, the properties go back to the wife. Um, so, so the, the ketubah is supposed to protect the, the rights of the wife. So, if he was mad at her and he said. Take, take your ketubah and leave. I want to dissolve the marriage. Um, then uh, he, would, he wouldn't do it so easily because he said, wait a second, I'm going to lose the property. Um, so the ketubah, it's, it's a way to... So, so a testy husband can't just throw his wife out. So you, you, know, so you have, they have to work it out. Okay, go to a little marriage counseling, you know. Go to the beach, take a cruise, whatever, and get over it. Anyhow, um, so what about the, the metal vessels? What's the impurity of the metal vessels? It's, it'll be explained uh, in the following lines. Shamai v'hilo gazru tuma al yadayim. Shamai v'chilo decreed impurity over the hands. The key term, and if you were to ask, Shamai v'siyato v'hilo v'siyato. Let Shamai follow his law and Hilo follow their law. Let the faction of Shamai go this way and the faction of Hilo go that way. Amar of Yehuda, Amar Shmuel, Shmona Asar Devar Gazru. They decreed 18 things. So the Shmona Asar Nechluku. And they disagreed about 18 things. So, Hillel and Shammai, Lo Nechluku, Ela Bishlosha Mokomot. But only Hillel and Shammai, they actually only had a dispute about three things. The Mar of Huna, according to Rav Huna, Bishlosha Mokomot Nechluku. The two left. The Kitem Atu Inhu Gazru Litlot, Atu Tamodaihu Gazru Lisrof. And if you were to ask, let these come, the meaning Hillel and Shammai, and decree about uh, the law of hands that it's it's uh, that it's hanging, that it's uh, not yet decided. The things that, that so Hillel, with Hillel and Shammai, let's just say that things that have become impurity because just somebody touched them and you weren't sure if his hands were impure. They just say that it may be impure, it might not. Just put it aside and say, we don't know. If you follow Beit Hillel, it's one thing, it's follow Beit Shammai, the other thing. Like today, where people have Spartak law, Ashkenazi law, Yemenite law. Just, okay, let, it, let, it, let the decision hang. They say it's an undecided thing. Like there are a lot of things still today that are undecided in Jewish law. We need to send Hedrin that most of the country accepts in order to resolve these contradictions. But the current nascent Sanhedrin is not willing to touch those things yet until they get some other basic things worked out. Because they don't want to cause a, too much uh, splash in Israel. Anyhow, but so you go to your, one of the great poskim today to, to decide for your own community, and other communities do differently. And one, one post cannot say, you follow only my law and you can follow no one else's law, because someone, the other post might say another thing. That's called the exile. 
So, so let it be an exilic thing where you follow oh, Beis Shammai with the, the okay, his hands touch this and it's tame, but according to Beit Be Hillel, but Hillel, but according to Beit Shammai, it's impure, and according to Beit Hillel, it's pure. But lowly strofotam, don't burn them. Just take the impure, the things that you're not sure about their status of impurity, and and you put them aside. But you don't need to burn it because uh, it's, uh, I'm not saying it's if you burn something that you know is impure, right? But my Ilfa, the, the sage Ilfa said, Yedayim tzchila gazrein on the sreifa. Initially, they said that anything was touched with the hands of that were stam yedayim, your basic hands were impure. A person touched truma, um, uh, tied to produce with the hands. You have to take the truma and burn it because it couldn't be given to the coin and it couldn't be eaten by anyone else because truma is only for the priests. Like today, when we have truma, what do they do? They tie it up in very nice little plastic baggies and they put it in a respectful, give it a respectful burial, or perhaps burn it. I don't know, some something respectful. But you can't do anything with it because you don't know who a priest is. So Ilfa said, Yedayim Tchilat Gazrin on the Sreifa. Initially, something that would be impure from the hands was decreed, burn it. But rather, these came and they made a decree, and they didn't. The others didn't accept it. The people did. They, they made the decree, but the people didn't accept the decree. And then the students came and they made the decree, and they accepted them. So it was the students of Beit Hillel that accepted these 18 decrees where Beit Shammai won. Vakati Shlomo Gazar. But still, Shlomo made, King Shlomo, King Solomon made Gazarot. It's not, it's not uh, who, made, who made the Gazarot but the Tzulet Yadayim? It wasn't, the Gemara says, wait a second. Wait, what's, what was said before was wrong. The Gemara questions it. Who do, we, who do we say decreed about Natuli to Dayim? When, when it, this 18, one of these 18, the Beit the be, be Shammai is saying it's Tam Yudayim or Tame. Why did Beit need to do this? This was already enacted in the days of King Solomon. As we find from Amar of Yehuda Marshmul, B'Shashi Tigan Shlomo Eruvinu Nitil Yedayim Yatsta Bat Kol Vamra Beni Im Chacham Nibecha Yismach Libi Gam Ani Chacham Beni V'Samach Libi V'Ashiva Chorfi Davar. So what does this mean? That when King Solomon, sitting in Jerusalem or wherever, made a decree. He said there, we're going to have people wash their hands ritually before eating bread or touching uh, holy things. Or after bathroom, there's 11 times in modern in Jewish law when a person has to ritually wash their hands, pouring one over, take, filling up a cup with water and pouring one over the other three times, right? Um, after coming out of the bathroom, uh, after coming out of a cemetery, etc., you can look it up. Um, you know, before eating bread, um, so these eleven times it was already in the days of King Solomon who instituted. Then he also instituted Erevin, Shabbos. You can't carry. You can't take your your this book and go outside into the street with it unless you have a kosher eruv around your neighborhood or city, which the eruv combines everything. So a, a voice came down from heaven and said the following verse. The verse is written in uh, Mishle, 23. My son, if you're smart, if your heart was, was clever and intelligent, then my heart will also rejoice. Now, the, the Yehudiya Kaddush, the great Hasidic rabbi Yaakov Yosef Rabinovitz, uh, he was the first one to prove that you could be a davener and a learner at the same time, except aside from maybe Rabbi Nachman or Breslov. The Yehudiya Kodesh in the Eastern Europe. He said, um, this is an Ishbitz Torah because the Ishbitz came from Pshischa. The Yehudiya Kodesh was from Pshischa. And his spiritual descendants were the Ishbitzer and the Ritziner, Kotzker. So, um, 
the Yehudi Kodesh said, why was God so happy about Shlomo when he made these two laws of the Eruv, the symbolic boundary in Shabbat, enabling you to carry from the, between public and private domains? And, and why was he, God so happy about Netilat Yadayim? Now, Netilat Yadayim, the Yehudi Kodesh, Yehudi Kodesh says that it literally means to remove your hands, to cut, to come away. And Erevin literally means to be mixed together. La'arev, la'arbev, right? Uh, to mix together. So he said that's the secret of life. The, God was so happy with Shlomo enough to have a vo- heavenly voice come down and say, Bini, im chacham libi, yismach libi gamani. He was so happy that it was a worthy of bat kol, a heavenly voice, of, so to speak, God speaking, so to speak. Why do you, why, what's so special about these? It's because it's the secret of life, the Yehudiya Kodr said. He said, you need to know when to be with people, with your community, that's Erevin, mixed together with your community and your friends, and you need to know when the two of you dying, which is not just literally washing your hands, but removing your hands, when to stay away, when to take your hands out of it and be alone, and not be mixed in with other people. And that is the secret of life and Shabbos stuff. You dalit on the best good Shabbos.